Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Please join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletins. Happy are those who do not ridicule and scoff, but who delight in God's teachings and meditate on them day and night. They yield fruit in due season, and their leaves do not wither. And now please join me in the hymn of praise, number 276, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 276. Good morning, saints. I'm reminded that the Lord watches over our ways. Let us then put our trust in God's grace and confess our sins. Let us together pray. God, though you call us to delight in your teachings, we can become cynical and full of doubt. Do not judge us, we pray, but heal us and restore us to you. Guard us and protect us from evil and sanctify us in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
in Christ Jesus, God has promised to forgive us and reconcile us to God and to each other. With joy, let us share that peace with one another. Believe the promise given to you. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We continue by uniting our voices in using chapter 9 of the Scots Confession to say what we believe. That our Lord Jesus offered himself a voluntary sacrifice unto his Father for us, that he suffered contradiction of sinners, that he was wounded and plagued for our transgressions, that he, the clean, innocent Lamb of God, was condemned in the presence of an earthly judge, that we should be absolved before the judgment seat of God, that he suffered not only the cruel death of the cross, which was accursed by the sentence of God, but also that he suffered for a season the wrath of his Father, which sinners had deserved. But yet we avow that he remained the only well-beloved and blessed son of his Father, even in the midst of his anguish and torment, which he suffered in body and soul to make full atonement for the sins of his people. From this we confess and avow that there remains no other sacrifice for sin. Amen. And continuing with the peace, we believe God loved the world so much that God sent his only son so that all who received him into their hearts would not have to die forever, but could have everlasting life. Such love brings us peace as nothing else can. Without moving from where you now stand, please take the next few moments to share a warm greeting and a sincere sign of God's peace with those around you. Thank you, please be seated. Okay, I'm going to try standing over here this week because then I don't have my back to anybody. Is that better? That's better, right? Okay, so 
I used to listen, when I would listen to the radio in the morning, right, they would play a game, and it was called The Answer is Meat. And whenever they would ask somebody a question, they would ask them a random question, like, what day is today? And the people, the answer was supposed to be meat, but people would answer correctly. They'd say, oh, it's Sunday. So today, our answer is mom. No matter what question I say, the answer is mom, okay? All right, because you, you'd be surprised how many people did not win the game on the radio because they would answer correctly instead of just saying meat. All right, so who is the first person that held you after you were born? Mom. Mom, mom right. When you were a baby, who helped and comforted you? Mom. Good. When you get hurt, who has the magic kisses and the Band-Aid? Mom, right. So mom's there for you all the time, right? Yes. All right. The game of mom is over. So yes, right? Sure. Yes. So as you get older, do you think you're still going to need your mom? Yes. 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 Maybe not as much, but guess what? No. You still will need her. Whether it's for advice, Mom. whether it's how to cook something, Mom. maybe it's how to do get a stain out of some clothes Mom. that your kids got in there, right? Because they're playing in the dirt. Mom. Yeah. Maybe even if you need some money sometimes, you call Mom and say, hey, can I get a quick loan? Yeah. I'm on my mom. But did you know, God knows that moms are important too, right? Yep. Who's probably one of the most important moms in the Bible? Mary. Mary, yes, yes, very good. Well, in today's scripture, when we're done here, right, it's going to say, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So God knew that moms were so important that he even compared himself to mom. I'm going to comfort you just like moms comfort their kids, right? Because that's a pretty special way to comfort, isn't it? It just always feels a little bit better when mom gives you a hug when you're upset, right? Yeah. So, he's not going to, does he say he's going to comfort like a friend or like a cousin? No. No. He says like who? Mom. Mom. Yes, like a mother. So, it's a pretty important day today, right? What is today? Mother's. We're talking about moms. What's today? Mother's Day. Mother's Day, right. So you guys are going to be extra good today, right? You're going to listen to your mom? Yes, yes. So let's remember today and every day, moms are super important to us, right? Yes. So let's say a big happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Say, ready? One, two, three. Happy Mother's Day. Yes. And Pastor Allen was nice enough to get everybody, all the moms and all the women in the congregation, a nice little box of goodies. So the kids are going to hand them out right now. So I'm going to bring the box over here.
Okay, <clears throat> today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 12 through 13, which is on page 697 in the Old Testament. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. For thus, the Lord, for thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. You shall nurse and be carried on her arm, and be dangled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's not raining in here. That's a good thing, right? One thing we don't have to fix. As a mother comforts her child, for lack of a better phrase, is the title for today's remarks. We're looking at Isaiah 66, verse 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. In fact, you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. As a mother comforts her child. Not rocket science. If you listen carefully to what Megan just said, you're halfway home. Let me take you the rest of the way. I think it was the first week of classes in my first year of seminary, which was called our junior year, junior, middler, senior, graduate school, divinity school. It was the first week of classes. And the, sem the professor of survey of the Old Testament, which was a required course, pronounced, the professor pronounced that everything, everything you need to know about God is contained in the Bible. No room for any omissions or things left out. Everything you need to know about God is contained in the Bible. That's why we read it and keep reading it and keep reading it and pray over it, pray over sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase. If you're into doing that, it's really a, a good thing to do. It's called a discipleship discipline, doing that. Frankly, I don't re remember thinking that there was any place to go in particular to find everything out about God, except maybe church. But the moment he said that phrase, everything you need to know about God is contained in the Bible, I remember thinking, I should have known that. I mean, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? Any of you surprised, shocked, hearing it for the first time? Everything about God that you need to know? And so the class continued on the first week and the second week and the third week, and we were working through the creation stories of Genesis, and I remember thinking we had learned the big O words, three of them when I was in confirmation class, the three O words that describe God. They're not, God's not limited to those three words, but they really do say a lot about what God's like and what God does. You remember confirmation class? You remember those three words? Oh. I thought one of my predecessors would have hammered that home. Omnipotent, omniscient, 
omnipresent, O, O, O. Does not omnipotent describe God? Limitless power? He can do everything? And yes, if you were a smart aleck in Sunday school, maybe you were the one in the class who asked the teacher, can God make a rock so big he can't move it? Or were only those wise cracks made in the church in Livingston where I grew up? Omnipotent. What can't God do if he puts his mind to it? Omniscient. Not a word you use every day. It means all-knowing. There isn't anything you could ask God that if he were talking back to you, he wouldn't answer. He knows everything. He knows more than we will ever even be able to comprehend. Our tiny little computer minds are limited in how many bytes they can handle. You couldn't possibly know everything there is to know about God, but God knows everything there is to know, period. And he certainly knows everything there is to know about us. Here's one we don't think about enough. God is omnipresent. You think you're off doing your own thing when you're bending God's rules? <laughs> God is always there, not just when you're bending his rules. But there's no place you can go. There's a psalm that even talks about that in the opening lines. I can't go anywhere that you are not there. How can I get away from you? I can't. Also in confirmation class, I remember when they gave us three action words for the Trinity that I had never heard before. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. I don't remember calling God Creator, but I call him that now, often in the beginning of my prayers, because he made everything before there was Home Depot and some place to go to get the stuff. God made it ex nilho, out of nothing. There's not much you and I can make out of nothing, except maybe trouble. Right, moms? Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, creator, redeemer, sustainer. The word for the spirit is sustainer. That's his action word. That's what he does. And he sustains us with spiritual gifts, which he gives us to build up the church and God's people. And he gives us power. You know those flames we all joke about that came to settle on the heads of the disciples and those who, they were gathered there to, to learn from them at Pentecost? Gifts and power, primary actions of the Holy Spirit. All six of these are big words, strong words, powerful words, words usually used in, as thought of as being masculine words. But thrown in there in confirmation class was the pronouncement that God is complete. Referring to the creation of Eve, I will make a helper fit for him, meaning Adam. You know, the lame guy who sat around and ate apples? Hey, Ruth, give me an apple. Or Budweiser. Or however you get your fruit. God doesn't need anybody else to be complete, to do anything. He asks us to help him, commands us at times to help him, 
but it doesn't need us the way Adam needed Eve to be complete. That was an important thing to learn, especially when you realize I learned it as we were moving towards the 70s. And certainly that's when I was in seminary, so I was learning it like crazy. Because that was right around the time our church and a lot of the mainline churches were starting to gather and ordain women as clergy. Now don't get defensive, ladies. This is not bad about you. But they started, as they were writing prayers for worship, occasionally throwing in Mother God instead of Father God. And see you all frowned? You don't like the sound of that. Too bad. God is complete. He is both holding the attributes of maleness and femaleness, of strength and compassion, of comfort, as well as obedience. Mother God, boy, that grated on me in my 20s. Didn't say that in Scripture. Oh, wait a minute. Isaiah 66, 13. Well, we don't pay a lot of attention to that. How many of you memorized that verse in Sunday school? As a mother comforts her child. So I will comfort you. And you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the spiritual home of God's children, the Israelites. And if they could afford it and didn't live in Jerusalem, they made an effort to travel from wherever they were living, at least once in their lifetime, when Passover was being celebrated, to go to Jerusalem to celebrate it. In fact, I don't know what they do today, but when I was this age and I was with my Jewish friends and I went to temple with them around Passover, they used this phrase at the table, the Seder table, you know? Next year in Jerusalem. We couldn't get there this year. We're stuck here in Livingston. But next year, maybe, we'll be able to get to Jerusalem, to our spiritual home, to the place where God symbolically lives. You know that gold box they used to carry around in the desert for 40 years? Well, that was his dwelling place symbolically. How about that? And God is saying to us, then and now, I will take care of you like your mother took care of you and comforted you when you were hurt, when you were afraid, when you were in trouble. I'll be there. Just like mom. You remember when you felt those feelings, you looked for mom or ran to mom? You can run to me. I will comfort you. Like mom. Mother God. Oh my. I'm still afraid to start a public prayer with that phrase. You don't have to worry. I won't be doing anything that radical. I hope you're smiling. I'm being sarcastic. I don't think the whole membership of the church has fully accepted that, and I can't imagine in my lifetime, as short as it now is, that it will happen in my lifetime. But if we take God seriously as being complete and not needing a helper for the sake of being complete, how can we not think of him 
with a feminine side as well as the obvious masculine, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, creator, redeemer, sustainer. How do you describe God? How did you describe him to your children? I didn't dare go home and tell my mother when I came home from seminary that first vacation <laughs> that people were praying, Mother God, come to my aid, forgive my sins, help me to be the person you made me to be and need me to be. I don't know, she may have handled it pretty well. I know she shocked me when I went to her at the, during the summer of my, before my senior year in high school, and I said, Mom, I'm the only kid in school who still has a crew cut. Do you think I could let my hair grow out a little bit? And her answer was, it's your hair. I said, what do you think Dad'll say? He'll say, it's your hair. <laughs> and he did. Mom was being a little omniscient there. Hmm. Do you question whether or not God is complete as he is? I wouldn't do it if you are. Today's lesson, today's reading, if you will, gives us cause to consider what some call the feminine side of the nature of God, as well because we find God inspiring Isaiah to quote God speaking to his children to describe himself as comforting us as a mother, comforts her child which implies not only God's power and ability, but it implies the relationship between God and the creatures he created, the two-legged ones. You can't limit God. And you can't limit God to not doing things that we normally attribute to the feminine role in our orderly lives. It is obvious to conclude that God wants his people to know him and expect him to comfort them. It's obvious that God wants us to turn to him when we need to handle fear, when we need to handle being bullied, when we need to handle being afraid, alone, or in trouble because there is nothing God hasn't forgiven us for. And what can anybody else do to us, really? Yes, pain, fear, being bullied, those things are out there all our lives. Neighbors, drivers on Route 80, people trying to knock us over with their shopping carts to get through the aisles so they can get out faster. All those things that might cause us a little anxiety or a lot. They're all things God wants to help us through, to comfort us from. including and maybe especially never needing to feel alone in our troubles. I clearly remember one of my first attempts at learning to ride a two-wheeler in front of our house, which was a chipstone pavement street. If you remember that obscenity of the 50s, they put tar down, and then they sprinkle these really sharp little stones from a quarry nearby. And then the tar gripped the stones and held them in place for the most part. 
But when you went tumbling off that bicycle, when you were losing your balance, your knee went down and your skin came off and the blood poured out and it hurt. And you cried out, at least in pain, if not a more prolonged cry. And my dad was holding those two little springs that cushion the seat that you're riding on on a two-wheeler. And when I fell off, he stopped dead in his tracks, stood there, looked at me, turned his head towards the house and yelled, Ruth! That was my mother's name. And what did Ruth do? She came running. Unfortunately, they hadn't invented Bactine yet, so she came running with Mercurochrome. That was worse than the fall. But he didn't know what to do, wasn't equipped to help in any way, first aid wise, but he knew to call mom. Ruth, come quick. Your son is hurt. <laughs> Not his son, her son. And I wasn't the only crybaby in history when it came to pain, fear, or being bullied. Remember David? He lived many different roles in the course of his life. Some of the psalms that he wrote, and he didn't write them all, but some of the psalms that he wrote, he wrote as a shepherd, a teenager, if you will. And several of the psalms that he wrote refer to his fear of the threats of his psycho king Saul. And I say that without any apology. Saul should have been in a mental institution. His rabid insecurities made him want to have David, this shepherd boy, instrumentalist who sang psalms to keep the sheep calm at night. He was a real threat to, to David's safety, and he, David never knew when it might come. At least once we have a specific reference in the Old Testament to Jonathan, David's best friend, but also, I believe, the eldest son of Psycho Saul, warned David, my father's out to get you. He's sent soldiers to kill you. You need to get out of here. You need to find a safe place to hide. You need to wait for him to calm down. And so David wrote a number of psalms crying out to God with his fear of psychosol. And one in particular that I refer to more often than some others was Psalm 121, which is a very general statement that takes into account the fact that God will comfort him. And he turns to God for that comfort, expecting God will comfort him. 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills, and where does my help come from? Do you ever look up? When you're in trouble and you don't know what to do next, or what's going to happen next? I lift up my eyes to the hills, and where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He will not be asleep on the job. Indeed, he who watches over Israel, God's family, 
will neither slumber nor sleep. So, of course, Isaiah was inspired by God to say for him, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. In fact, you'll be taken home to your spiritual house to be comforted in Jerusalem. It doesn't get any safer than that. God comforts like a mother comforts her child. Mothers, whether you try to or not, partially instinctively, partially driven by love, and the other factors too numerous to mention here, you have given your children and others and other people's children I remember a lot of kids when they had a problem came running to our house. We had a lady across the street that wouldn't let her kids in the house when they came home from school because she didn't want them to get it dirty. Not exactly a safe place for that friend. But moms give their children and those that are close to them and see them a glimpse of God a glimpse of God's attributes, something that you can expect, something that you can count on, something that will always be true about God, that in his omnipresence, he will be there for you so that you are never alone, no matter whatever you have cause to fear. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. What an attribute. Imagine if it had been left out of Scripture. Where would we turn? Who would we expect to be there for us? If mothers haven't given us a glimpse of God. Amen? You don't sound real confident about that. My friends, we are grateful to have all of you with us as we worship together on this seventh Sunday in Eastertide, which is also Mother's Day. I hope it means more to you than breakfast in bed and obedient children for a few hours. We hope that you will be stewardship partners with us in our ministry here and around the world as you have been partners with us in worship, whether here in our sanctuary or in some safer, more convenient place for you with your computer. If you worship with us on your computer and are able and willing, please consider mailing an offering to our church office to participate and share in supporting our mission and ministry. You know the address, 51 West Blackwell Street in Dover, New Jersey, 07801. And let, remind, let me remind you that God invites us to give the testimony of our hearts in practical offerings, including but not limited to money and time. Therefore, let us testify to God's love by bringing our gifts and let us unite our voices in our prayer of dedication, saying together, Jesus has made God known to us. We already belong to God, and so we dedicate these gifts to God's service and to the glory of God's name. Amen.
Good morning. Thanksgiving for the life of Dawn Gloria Rack. Prayers for her children, Hunter and Kendra, and her father as they uh, move forward with their lives. Sad to announce the passing of Dale Mertz, 93. Longtime member of this church who served as an elder, Sunday school teacher, and Boy Scout leader. Prayers to Dawn, his wife of 72 years, and his children and his grandchildren. Mission work. Cleaning out those closets, downsizing your household items. We're doing a used clothing drive. This will be collected on Saturday, June 1st, from 10 o'clock to 3.30 in our parking lot. If you're unable to donate at those times, please give us a call at the church. 973-366-0216, and we'll make arrangements for pickup. They are looking primarily for fabric-type items, so they are not looking for any dishes, but we're looking for towels, tablecloths, clothing, shoes, stuffed animals. Our other mission project is Operation Christmas Child. It's the month of May. We're collecting socks, underwear, and t-shirts for children, young ones all the way up through ages 12. This week at the church is Mission Christina Alim Church. They meet here on Sundays from 1 to 5, Monday, Tuesday, and Friday evenings. AA meets here on Monday, Wednesday, Saturday at noon, 
and Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Looking forward, we're having Vacation Bible School from August 5th through 9th. Hero Hotline is the theme for this year. We are holding a fish and chips, so hold this date, September 7th. It will be in dinner hours. This week's birthdays are Stephen Yearwood, Valerie Melky, Donald Lansing, and we're wishing all the mothers a very happy Mother's Day. Prayers for this week. Roger, Irene, Tiffany, Marilyn, and Caroline. Thank you, Kim. We believe, so we pray. I used to think that prayer was supposed to be easy, God. But the older I get and the more I pray, I have to face the fact that it isn't easier, at least not for me. Surely there are some aspects of prayer that are still as easy for me as now I lay me down to sleep, which is, after all, my introduction to a prayer life. Along with prayers that give thanks for the blessings I know I am receiving from you, like prayers for Mother's Day, and the, specifically the amazing mother who raised me and shaped me and nurtured me, and among many other things, taught me that first prayer and prayed it with me every night for years. And if I am fair, I have to admit she wasn't perfect. But even thinking that, much less saying that out loud, seems disrespectful and ungrateful. But across the years, I came to understand she didn't think she was perfect either. Although I believe she gave it her best shot and I certainly have no regrets. But there are so many more subjects screaming for prayer that are really rather difficult for me to figure out how to pray for, like the Hamas-Israeli war with the current installment of that conflict precipitated by a vicious invasion into private homes and neighborhoods resulting in atrocities, murders, and kidnappings, which from my innocent, uninvolved, an underinformed perspective seem to be violently overreacted to, and like what is still happening in Ukraine, my passionate, righteous reaction and prayers is that the combating parties just stop before another baby or innocent adult dies. But you already know how my passion gets stirred up, Lord by such things from what I have been praying for for a long time. And so I keep praying that you will keep trying to teach me and all of us, us slow learners, how to pray and how to figure out what to pray for. Please don't leave us to underpray for lack of not knowing how. And God, please hear our continued prayers for people fighting serious illness, like Roger Lindahl, who believes his road to recovery is going to be a rather lengthy one. And our seniors and other people in that time of life who, through no fault of their own, find themselves cut off from family and friends and familiar surroundings by geography or disability, like, but not limited to, Barbara Newman and Jane Curtin. So like our moms who never gave up trying to nurture us, no matter how old or how big we grew, please keep nurturing us in the disciplines of faith where no one of us is yet perfect. And hear the continuation of this prayer time as we recite the thoughts which Jesus taught us to pray about when he taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our parting hymn this morning is not found in our hymnal, but it was my mother's favorite hymn, so deal with it. In the garden, the words are printed for you in the bulletin. And you all know the history of that song, right? A World War I veteran comes home from Europe and sits in his mother's garden behind her house in Lakehurst, New Jersey, and commits his feelings and his faith to those words which still matter to so many people. And you thought nothing good ever came out of Lakehurst, besides blimps and the Hindenburg. Well, friends, we stand with all the faithful who've gone before us and with all the faithful who will come after us in one great fellowship of witnesses to the empty tomb, to many appearances thereafter, to answered prayer, divine guidance, 
and the miracle of life itself. Therefore, let us encourage one another with the faith that has been given to us. Let us lean on one another whenever our faith wavers. And may the voices of praise we've raised today reverberate throughout the halls of heaven, this day and every day, now and forevermore. And all God's children said, Amen. Please be seated for a moment of reflection and inspiration.